Well, good morning and welcome one more time to Encounter Church. We're so glad that you're here. We're in a series right now, last installment of the series called We Are Four. And uh, as you might remember, last week I said, hey, next week, come on back. We're changing some of the aesthetic around here. And we've got an exciting announcement as well. And so when you came in today, you may have noticed these values that we've been working our way through. We got those in like giant six-foot banners and we put them like all around the building. And hopefully they're going to stay up for a little while so we can always be reminded that here at Encounter Church, we are for keeping Jesus at the center, and we are for bringing people far from God to new life in Christ. We are for doing life together. We're for practicing truth. We're for loving where we live. This morning, we are for multiplying locally and globally. Before we get to the big energy exertion that is multiplying locally and globally and what that's all about, um, I want to acknowledge kind of just reading the room, right? Thanksgiving weekend, we heard it in the worship and the prayer this morning, that, uh, that this week for a lot of us uh, is just exhausting, okay? The Thanksgiving, you're maybe you're having people over or you're traveling. And, and so today, we're going to kind of move into this by asking this question, like, what do you do when you've got nothing left to give? What do you do when you've got nothing left in the tank? Like, what happens next? So some of you, I know, traveled all over for Thanksgiving. Maybe you went out of state or out of, like, city, county, whatever, to go visit family. And, that, and that's exhausting enough. That creates this... Uh, what I like to call like family fatigue, and I've got family here today, so I got to make sure to be, like be careful what I say. I understand that some of you do too, and you're like, "This is getting uncomfortable." Stick with me here. Family fatigue. No, no, it's good stuff. Is what I want to, especially dad. Right? No, it's good stuff. Family fatigue, but it's just like a lot of good stuff. We, my wife and I, we have family both in uh, in West Michigan here. So Thanksgiving holidays, we try to like see everybody. And for a long time, we could say like our kids need naps, and so it's just going to be one or the other. But now, right, it's like no, that excuse is off the table. We're seeing everybody. It's good stuff, but it's just it's exhausting, right? I mean, even if you even if you're not like the one uh, traveling, if you're having people over, it creates another kind of fatigue. It creates like, like chore or cooking fatigue, where you're trying to like d d cook this massive bird that you only do once a year. Or maybe you haven't ever even done one before, and this is like all new to you. And it takes hours to prepare. So you don't know whether you did it right or wrong until it's go time. And you either made everybody's holiday and set those expectations, or you ruined Thanksgiving for all of your closest friends and family, you know? <laughs> It creates this kind of fatigue. You're cleaning up, doing dishes afterwards, and then the next several days afterwards, it creates this drain. That's, it's all good stuff. It's just exhausting. Maybe there's a financial fatigue on you as well as you realize that we are now in this sprint from Thanksgiving right up till Christmas, and you're going, I've got to shop for X, Y, and Z for, you know, for all these people. Yeah. And you're going, I'm like drained already, and now, and now i got to like spending, you know, to get ready for Christmas coming up, it creates a financial fatigue. Like, whatever it is, all good stuff, it's just a lot. And so what do you do when you've got nothing left to give, left in the tank, let alone, like, multiplying locally and globally? Uh, we're going we're gonna to answer that question this morning or do our best uh, by going to someone who I think exemplified this just absolutely perfectly. Uh, Jesus. We're going to go, we're going to go to the gospel, the Jesus story according to John. If you'd like to follow along on your phone or in a Bible, they're underneath the chairs in front of you. Bibles, not phones. We're not giving those away. Uh, John chapter six. It's also going to be on the screen behind me. Um, but I want to like set it up by saying Jesus is tired. And we see that he is just so exhausted and so tired because he's been healing people and he's been, and he's been preaching to people and he's been teaching people. And he is just, he is peopled out. And it's all good stuff. He think, I think he'd be the first one to tell us that. It's just he's now tired. And that's where we find him in John chapter 6, tired. Where it says in, in verse 1, leading off, it says, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That's the Sea of Tiberias, for those of you where that makes more sense. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. And then Jesus went up on a mountainside and he sat down with his disciples. So what we just read is Jesus, not out of like this massive, like I feel like traveling today and I feel like walking around today. No, no, no. It's out of his fatigue. It's out of his exhaustion that he just tries to get away. First, he gets in a boat. He sails across the Sea of Galilee because the boat's faster than 
feet. And he thinks, I can, I can just get out of here. And he gets to that town, and some people from that town starts gathering around him. They're like, this is, this is the guy. This is Jesus. And so they start crowding in. And so he, he's over on the other side of the lake now, and he goes, no, 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 I got to get away further. And so he retreats again up to this mountainside where he can finally have a little phone time with just his boys. There's no way he called his disciples boys, or it wasn't phone time. But like he pulls back, you get the idea, to just him and just his disciples because he's looking for rest. I mean, that's just, this is, he's a just plain fatigued and tired. And just as he's like settling in, he looks up. And what does he see in verse 5? He looks up and he saw a great crowd coming toward him. He's like, you've got to be kidding me, right? I mean, I just pulled away. I just closed my eyes for a second. And when I like blink them open, there's a massive crowd like heading this way. Like they knew where I was going and they crossed over on foot. And now they're meeting them here again. So, so like this question, what do you do, right? When you have nothing left to give. Jesus is now gearing up for like round 12 and he is tired and he's exhausted and his disciples are too. But instead of just retreating back, instead of running away yet further, instead of disengaging, he does something really unexpected. And it's in this unexpected thing that, that we learn these spiritual truths that I think could transform our week, hopefully, month, or even longer than that. And this is what he does. Instead of retreating, instead of pulling back, he said to Philip, he goes, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? Now John, who's writing this story, like inserts this comment. He goes, oh yeah. yeah he asked this only to test him. For, he, for Jesus already had in mind what he was going to do. What do? Where are you going to get bread to feed these people? Is what he asked Philip. Now, um, note on that here. He's got this crowd in front. We're going to see later on. 5,000 men are in this crowd. Uh, they didn't count women. They didn't count children in the official head count numbers. I don't know why. It's just kind of the way things were back then. So scholars, theologians, put the historians, archaeologists, put this, a story like this together and say, it would be reasonable to assume then that if it was 5,000 men, there's probably more like 15,000 or possibly 20,000 like, like total people in this crowd. So we're talking like Jesus up on the mountainside. He's looking down and he's seeing this massive, massive crowd. Just like for comparison's sake. A Van Andel Arena downtown Grand Rapids holds just over 10,000 people. We're talking about two uh, Grand Rapids arena-sized people, crowd, gathered down in front of Jesus. Now, that's a, that's a big crowd. And he, and he turns and he looks at Philip and he goes, hey, like they're hungry. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you going to buy bread to feed everybody? I'm sorry, what? Now, I, th- I have this, this is just me. I have this, this hunch that the reason why he asked Philip is because Philip is a guy who, who just, like, he loves the tangible. He, he loves, like, the, like, seeing things. You know, way back in John uh, chapter 1, uh, when, when Jesus is, like, calling some of his disciples to, uh, here together, he calls, uh, or uh, we find Philip going to his friend Nathaniel. And he said, I heard that there was this new Messiah, this rabbi, this guy by the name of Jesus. And, and we see Philip, first time interaction, he goes, let's go check it out. He says, come with me and see. Let's see firsthand with our own eyes. That's kind of the kind of guy that Philip is. Other times we, we drop in and Philip, and he's in the upper room with Jesus, and Jesus is like, is speaking, and, and you don't know if it's like metaphor, if it's literal, like what is going on here. But we see later on in the book of John where Jesus is talking about how He's saying, I am the Father in one. I am in he, and he is, is in me. And it's, all, it's very confusing, that much we know. But it's, it's Philip who speaks up, and, and he says, Jesus, you know, this would be a lot clearer. Maybe if, maybe if you just revealed your Father to us. And it's like, dude, Philip, you just asked to, like, meet God, the Father, face to face. Like, yes, Jesus, like, I don't know, have some humility, bro. Like, what, what's the, but that's the kind of guy that Philip, Philip, Philip is the guy that wants, like, tangible, physical evidence, the proof. That's Philip. And so for Jesus to turn to Philip and say, where are you going to buy bread? He knows Philip is the guy who's going to think about that. 
And Philip definitely thinks about that. In fact, he answers with this problem. This is the most Jewish thing ever. When somebody asks a question, he doesn't answer with an answer. He a- answers with like a statement or possibly another question. So Philip answered in verse 7. He's saying, it would take more than a half a year's wages. Literally, he says, it would take over 200 denarii to buy enough bread for each person, for each one to have a bite. We're not talking meals. We're talking just a bite. So Philip looks across. He does the math. That's the kind of guy that Philip is. And says, I'd have to work for eight months just to buy enough bread for everybody to have a bite, let alone a meal. Now, what we got to understand, friends, is this thing that Jesus was asking was impossible and everybody knew that it was impossible. Okay, even if, like, boom, by some miracle, there's, there's a food court, like, put right out there outside the town. And you could actually buy. Even if the miracle was that somehow they were just loaded and without, like, credit card, they were literally carrying around, like, bags and sacks of money, probably with, like, the little black dollar sign on them, and they're walking around with this. They had the money. Even if, like, all of that were to happen, there still isn't the technology able to feed 20,000 people all at one time. This isn't a catering company. They didn't have, they didn't have electricity. They didn't have gas ovens. They didn't have a microwave, one of the most important tools in the kitchen, if, you know, according to me. But they didn't, have, they didn't have any of this stuff. It's impossible to, like, to feed everybody. And Philip comes back, right, and says, like, Jesus, listen, what you're asking for I mean, it's way out there. And he just narrows in on the cost. I could get, Philip's the kind of guy, I could give you a hundred reasons why this isn't going to work, but I'll just give you one. The cost, it's too expensive. And then we get another insight. Not from Philip this time. Because some of you are like Philip people, right? Where you're like, if you're asked to, for something, you'll, you'll find up like a number of good reasons why that thing can't be done. Others of you are more like the Andrew types. The Andrew types come back with this. Verse 8, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up and says, hey, hey, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But, But how far will they go among so many some of you are like Philip people, right? Where it's like, I'll give you a hundred reasons or, or just stick with one about why this, is, this idea isn't going to work. Others of you are Andrew people and you're going like, you know what, I'll try one thing and it's not going to work out. At least he was going out among the crowds. At least he was like, hey, anybody got a lunch? Anybody? Okay, we got a kid. You know, bring the kid forward. I mean, I'll try one thing and I'll show you with that one thing of why it's just not going to work. And at this point, we got Philip people, we got Andrew people. I just want to ask, like, has anybody been in that place where God has maybe asked you to do something and you you came with the answer of, I can't? Which is, in their own kind of way, what Philip and what Andrew are doing in in different approaches, but they're both giving Jesus the answer, "I, I can't. And Jesus is like, listen, friendo, I didn't ask you if you could or not, I, I told you to do it. But our response, of course, I can't. So I, I just want to ask, like, has, has maybe anybody felt that nudge? We talk about the Holy Spirit inside of us, like God living inside of us. That's like a tenet of the Christian faith, in case you're wondering. And, and sometimes what that looks like is like the Holy Spirit, that God like nudges us. And we get this like feeling of restlessness, right? I think maybe God is asking me to do something or, or I feel like oddly compelled or oddly drawn to something. And often that's how God speaks to us. And you feel that nudge, you feel that draw to maybe like invite a coworker or, or a fellow student or a housemate or, or, or a family member over to your Thanksgiving, and you think about that and you think, maybe, is that from God? Is that just like last night's burrito? Like, what is that? And, but whatever the case is, you end up like saying back to God, responding to that nudge, I can't or I, I won't. And you have that nudge maybe, right? When we get that nudge, we're just doing good campaign and we're just creating those nudges. And I know what we're doing. We're creating those opportunities for God to move in your hearts to say, you know, whether it's, whether it's donating blood, diapers, or food to the pantry, maybe serving at the pantry, you have this like nudge and you're like, well, maybe, maybe like this is something that I want to do. Maybe this, is, maybe this is something God is asking me to do. And we respond like Philip or like Andrew and saying, I can't. 
or the person at the office or the neighbor or the family member that you've so badly wanted to invite for church for so long and you're like, why is this so weird? It doesn't have to be weird. I think they would actually like the experience if they came, but I can't. And again, Jesus is turning to his disciples and I think now he's turning to each one of us and he's saying, is it I can't or is it I won't? Because what Jesus is saying between the lines is, I never asked you if you could or not. I asked you to simply do it. And this is where it gets exciting, right? And this is where it gets exciting because it's, 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 it's in that point where, where we look at the mountain that needs to be moved. It's in that moment where we see what needs to be done. And the disciples are now are now thinking to themselves and all of us along with it in whatever nudges, whatever things God is asking to each one of us. And, and we're looking back at God and saying, no, no, but you don't understand. What you're asking for, boy, it's impossible. You know, and, and that's what it comes down to. It, it isn't possible. Okay, before I respond to that, I, what I want to do, do is, is really just share back with you something that you all, in your own kind of way, have given me over the years. So this is your thing. This isn't my thing. I'm just giving it, giving it back to you. Um, I started out college. I went right on to cemetery, which is <laughs> <laughs> seminary. Thank you. And, we, right, and I went right through this like, whole program. I got my pastor degree there and then started out in, uh, in a living room with what would be called Encounter Church. A bunch of you were there, and that's awesome, like a handful, and you're still here too, which is even cooler, I think. But then we're like starting out, like friends, 26, 25 years old, I knew nothing if I didn't read it in a book. Like just totally no clue, anything was happening. I didn't know what being a pastor was and just like, no idea whatever, whatsoever. It was just, I think God is asking us to, to nudging us in this direction. And, and I don't know if it's possible or not, but let's say yes and let's at least see where God takes us with it. And then you all, you all started investing in me. You all started pouring into me. And like looking around the room, like I know, and I also know a lot of people that aren't here today, just the stories that you all have shared with me and, and have given me this, this firsthand experiential education. And I am so deeply grateful and, and indebted to all of you for that. You all have shared with me your, your own stories of, of abandoning dreams. And you've shared your own stories with me about losing hope or health. You have all have shared and invested into, into me the, these stories of, of struggle and stories of, of sometimes defeat and sometimes triumph and sometimes victory. And have just like poured it more and more into me stories of wayward children and stories of stale marriages or unfaithful even marriages. These, these stories where it seems like there is nothing left at all. And I'm just telling you this because you've all told me this. And I'm telling you now that the, what you've taught me is that the end of yourself is the beginning of God right? Because your stories are stories, right? And I'm looking around, I'm seeing these faces nodding, and you're going, you know, it was at that moment, Dirk, and you were there. I brought you into that moment when there was nothing left, when I had nothing left. And it was in that moment when I thought it was gone for good completely that God showed up. Now, we say things like, Jesus, you know, you don't understand what you're asking for. It's impossible. And now God is saying impossible. Impossible is where I start. Like, I don't show up until it's impossible. You don't need me if it's possible on your own. It isn't a miracle. It isn't an act of God if it's just possible. That's just that's just you doing it. Impossible is where I start. Now, before we get like, to the big, the big takeaway, the big like the thing that I hope you carry into your weeks and months, maybe even year ahead, I, I want to like just point some things out in the story here, right? Where Jesus comes along and he's got this boy. Um, he's got this, this boy that they drag around, um, you know, how far will they go among so many? He's got the five, he says like small barley loaves, but it's actually like, think big crackers or maybe like rolls or something like that, and, and, uh, and two uh, fish sticks, right? He's got crackers and fish sticks, you know, and it's like 
spread these things around. And you, you kind of have this suspicion already. You're like, I, I think he's going to try to feed 20,000 people with, with the crackers and fish sticks. And, you know, spoiler alert, you're right. But, like, notice, before we go there, though, and before we get to our big takeaway, notice something with me, for me, will you, would you? It's a small boy that he's bringing, which I think is so cool because, because this small boy, he has, he has literally discounted by everybody around. What I mean by that, he has, he has, in the most literal sense, not counted. He doesn't count. When they're doing the head count, remember what I said, it's 5,000 men. It's probably more like 15, 20,000 total people, but it's 5,000 men because they didn't count women and they didn't count little girls and now little boys. He isn't counted. Just think about the meal coming from somebody who wasn't ever counted, who was discounted who was left out, who didn't matter by anybody. Like, that's the, kind of, that's the kind of God that we serve, right? And I think that one of the reasons, this is just bonus material for, for your, you know, kind of understanding, that one of the reasons why is I think God loves to tell these stories of people who are discounted, who are uncounted, these stories of people who didn't have the resources enough, who weren't networked enough, who weren't celebrity enough. These stories of people who didn't have enough influence because it's like stories of those because, because those are the stories of impossibility, right? People with resources, people with networks, people with celebrity, like those are the stories, well, yeah, I can understand how that was all accomplished. I mean, they had a lot to work from from the beginning. But God says, no, no, I like to tell the stories of the little boys and the little girls. I like to tell the stories where there wasn't enough celebrity or wasn't enough networks or resources or what. There wasn't enough smarts in the room. I like to tell those kind of stories because then the glory doesn't go to the little boy. We don't talk about him. The glory goes to God and God alone because he is the one who's showing up now in, in the impossible. There's a first like bonus material, just the little boy who wasn't counted. But think too, about the one who was packing his lunch that day, who also wasn't counted. You know who packs lunch? I'll give you a cultural hint. 2,000 years ago, Middle Eastern culture, it wasn't dad, okay? Dad wasn't the one packing up the, the lunch that day. And you just have this picture of a, of a mom in her, in her little home, in her little cottage or house somewhere, and, and she's packing her kids' lunch up for the day, never once realizing that what she is doing is, is just about to change the world. That we're going to still be talking about her 2,000 years ago. This is the kind of woman, she's not counted among everybody else, but God is using her mundane, routine task that she doesn't give a second thought to to change the world. Dads and moms getting ready to send your kids to school tomorrow. By the way, tomorrow again, it's been a little while, but you're going to like get them ready and you're going to make them breakfast and you're going to make them a lunch maybe tonight if you, if you work ahead of time. And it's this like routine, mundane task that you're not going to give a second thought. And God is saying, I could change the world with that right there. When you go to work tomorrow and you don't love it, it's not everything, you know, but it's something. And you don't think, this is a game changer, and God is saying, you don't understand what I can do. I could change the world with that time that you spend on the job site, that you spend in the office, that you spend with the kids, that you spend cleaning the house, that you spend cooking the meals. I can change the world with all of that. You don't think it's possible, but God says, I begin with the impossible. And now we're inching closer. We still haven't found it yet, but we're inching closer to that thing, that nugget, the thing that I hope you leave with today. We're inching closer when Jesus said this in verse 10. When Jesus said, have the, the people sit down. By the way, 20,000 people, 12 disciples. I think the real miracle, we have trouble feeding, seating all of you, but 12 disciples, 20,000 people. That's, that's a minor miracle right there. Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. They sat down. 5,000 men, remember, not including women and children, not including the boy and his mom where the lunch came from. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks. Pause. He gave thanks. I wouldn't do this if it wasn't Thanksgiving, but Jesus gave thanks. 
over five crackers and two fish sticks that were supposed to be stretched to 20,000 people. It's Thanksgiving weekend. I feel like I have to point out there, friends, Jesus gave thanks for what he knew would not be enough. He gave thanks for what he knew wasn't enough. I just wonder how our lives would be different if we gathered together, not just on Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving weekend, but every day. And we gave thanks over our not enough. Right? We, we, we gathered together as, as families, as friends, maybe as small groups or churches and say, the health is failing. It isn't what I wanted it to be and I give you thanks even though it isn't enough. It isn't the house that I've always wanted or dreamed of. It's an apartment that I hoped I wouldn't have to renew the lease on and now I would. It isn't enough, but Jesus, I give you thanks for it because it is a roof. I don't love the job it isn't a career, it isn't a place that I wanted to end up at, and it seems like I'm ending up at. God, it, Jesus, it isn't enough, but Jesus, I thank you for my not enough. I wonder how our lives, our worlds would change if, if we follow that. But after Jesus gives thanks for his not enough, he turns the next line, he turns and he distributes it to those who are seated as much as they wanted, and he did the same with the fish. I don't know how this works, if they've got like buckets or something. It's, it's a few crackers and, and, and fish sticks. Like, like it's not a lot, but, but for whatever reason, somebody else tells us they circled up in groups of 50, so I don't know how many groups there were, but, but the disciples go out and, and, they, and they've got their buckets with a couple crackers and a pieces of, of fish stick, and, and they start like distributing it right to the people around, and, and for some reason, the buckets don't run out, and I don't know if it just like they saw it multiply or if it like happened in the air somewhere. Those are details. That, by the way, this story is told four times. It's the only miracle that's told in all four Gospels, and nobody ever like, explains just what it was like for them to hand out the crackers and fish sticks to everybody around. And, but for whatever reason, the buckets just never ran out. It never emptied out until everybody eats, and everybody gets their stomachs filled. 20,000 people or so. It is a miracle. It's a miracle that, ne listen to me, that never would have happened if that boy didn't give up his lunch. I mean, just think about it. Think about Andrew coming through the crowds. Does anybody have a lunch? People are hungry. Does anybody have some food to eat? And the impression that we get from the story is that every single guy in that crowd, every single adult, looks around at the crowd, and there's no possible, you're not telling me that that kid is the only kid who had a lunch that day. So I'm looking at the dads in the crowd, and they're looking around at the, everybody around, and they brought something, a few of them at least brought something, and they're going, no way, it isn't enough. And they keep it to themselves. The boy is the only one that never keeps it to himself, but shares and says, I've got one. I've got a lunch. My mom packed it for me before I left today. I, I've got something. Here, you can have it. And he hands it over. He gives it to the disciples. And the disciples are going, are you kidding me? This is the only thing that we have collected from everybody around. And they gather this stuff up, right? And they decide, you know, we could all at least have a little something to eat. Maybe we could, we could break the big crackers in half or the little loaves in half. And then we've got 12 items. You get a fish stick, you get a half a loaf. Right? We could at least have something in our stomachs. The disciples, right, they could have kept it to themselves. But if we keep to ourselves, if they kept to themselves, if the boy keeps to himself, he never gets to see the miracle happen, does he? We never get to see the impossible happen when we keep it to ourselves. So if there's one truth that I think comes out of this story that I want you to take into your week, if there's like one thing that at least for today, for, for this year maybe, or for this season that you take 
I hope that you take this away, that friends, what is given away is what is multiplied. Right? We don't see the miracle. We don't see the multiplication by hoarding, by keeping to ourselves, by closing the fist around the little things that we have. We don't see what God, with the impossible that God can do with it all. What's given away is what is multiplied. And why, why would we expect anything else? You know? Like so much, so much of creation just works this way. It's, it's almost like God embedded this spiritual reality into this world that he has made and set up and set spinning. You know, come springtime, my yard, maybe yours too, is going to like be overgrown with dandelions. And your kids and my kids are going to love it. Right? Especially the week or two after the dandelions, when the, like the, the little weeds with the white poofy things start showing up everywhere. They, they love it. Because they carefully go down, right, into the grass, and they, like, pick it up, making sure not to spill any of the white fluffies anywhere. And they bring it up, and they're like, Dad, Dad, Dad. And it just blows everywhere. I get dirty looks from my neighbors miles away. I just know it. Right? Because they know, and you laugh, and you all know, that what's given, you know that truth, that what's given away is what's multiplied. That God embeds it right into the dandelions growing, right? That, that that dandelion withers and dies and becomes this wispy little thing. And not keeping everything to itself, but, but like giving those white fluffies away is how the dandelions spread all throughout the neighborhood and city. What's given away is what's multiplied. You guys get this, New Year's resolutions coming up. Maybe Thanksgiving was a bit heavier, right? And so, so you're like, this is the year I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to do whatever. You know the truth. We've all known the truth. If you want to run a long ways or if you want to lift really heavy things, the first, middle, and last thing that you have to do is start running a long ways and start lifting heavy things. Because you know that the truth, the reality that got embedded into this creation is that what's given away, what's exerted, and what's spent is what's multiplied. Several weeks ago, we did this message on doing life together. We talked about like, cultivating these, these, these deep, uh, intimate relationships, these friendships of, marked by trust and vulnerability. And it's like, how do I get that? It struck a chord because I heard a lot about it. And it struck this, this chord deep down. It's like, how do I get some of that? And we come back to this truth again and again and again that what's given away is what's multiplied. It's, it's by exerting that trust, that vulnerability. It's by exerting that, in, that intimacy with another person. What's given away, that's what's multiplied. Jesus, in this story, it's so incredible. You know, a lot of people think that it's a retelling of the Exodus story, the, uh, Moses and the Israelites coming out into the wilderness. Because in both stories, you got their leader up on a mountain, right? You got the people eating manna, eating that, that dust, eating their not enough kind of bread. It isn't enough. It isn't far enough. And you see what happens, except for Jesus in the retelling is better than Moses. He's the true Moses. He's the one who did it right. He didn't get angry. He didn't strike the rock. He didn't. No, Jesus does everything right. He takes the not enough. He takes the bread instead of grumbling about it like all the Israelites did in the wilderness that time. He distributes it to everybody and everybody gets enough. And then, and then the next chapter, Jesus says in the Gospel of John, oh, by the way, that bread that spread around, that bread that was given for you, that's me. I am the bread of life. What's given away that's what's multiplied. And we see Jesus. We see Jesus as the bread of life. We see Jesus take that bread and we see Jesus say, this is my body. And we see that, that Savior break his body. We see that Savior give his body over and say, I have life. I have heaven. Yet I'm giving my life, I'm giving my heaven over to you so that you may have eternal life. Because Jesus gets it. Jesus gets that what's given away is what's multiplied. And so he gives his life away for the salvation, for the eternal life of everyone who will put their hope in him, the only one who no matter what is enough. I said a little while ago, I said last week, I said, we have a fun announcement, a big announcement uh, to make. So come on back 
you know, to church again. It's gimmicky, but you're here. Uh, <laughs> when you leave today, if, if you take the main doors right out here, the double doors, a couple sets, and you're going to go out on that green wall, there's a giant sign, six-foot sign, new one, put up this week, that says that we multiply. That's what we do in Counter Church. We multiply locally and globally. And we do that as individuals. We do that by inviting our, our friends, our coworkers to the job sites and in the office. We do that by, by inviting our family members who don't know Jesus yet. We do that by, by sharing the love of God, by sharing the love of Jesus with everybody on an individual by individual basis. And so we multiply wherever we go here in West Michigan and around the world. You wouldn't believe the stories that I get. So we multiply locally and globally. But now, a couple weeks ago, our, our governing board, our lead team, or council, you might call it, uh, set out the target, the goal of saying by the fall of 2019, we're going to multiply this church locally and possibly then on globally. But we're going to start right now with as an institution, as an organization, this church multiplying. Some of you who've been around here for a little while, you might remember that we talked about this in the early days. We you know, in the school day, in the cafetorium days, we used to talk about how, how God is bringing these people in, and this is what kind of church we're going to be. We're going to be a multiplying kind of church so that God is going, to, is going to grow his kingdom, not just by addition in one place, but multiplication in multiple places. We are going to multiply locally and globally. It's a year and a half away. There's a lot to do, a lot that has to come into place. And I don't know how it's going to work all the time. I def definitely don't know that. But I know that you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So we're going to put that target on the map and say fall 2019. Now, we don't know a lot. I don't know a lot. And so especially if you call this church home, really, if your partner's here, you're going to have to speak into this thing and show us like, what it's going to be like. How are we going to multiply here? How are we going to do this thing? This new church that goes out, where, where is it going to go and who's going to go? Who, who's God going to raise up as the leader of this thing? I don't know. This church that goes out, is it going to have Encounter's name on it like a campus or a satellite? Or is it going to be something totally unrelated to our way of doing things and our structure, which is also to the glory of God because we're all on the same team here? I don't know. Is it going to be like a live teaching, preaching team or is it going to be a video thing? I don't, we don't know. These are all questions that we're going to have to figure out sooner rather than later. But here's what I do know. I do know that it's going to cost something. I know that it's going to cost us in terms of resources, financial and time and talent. I know that we're going to we're going to experience the strain on the, on the systems as they are already as, as we try to like birth out this, this new thing. I know that it's going to cost something in terms of asking many of you who are in the room today, if you wouldn't mind considering going with that and blessing that place so that God can continue growing his kingdom and telling, now multiplying exponentially more people about the love of Jesus for the lost in this world and in our city in Grand Rapids. I know that it's going to cost something. And finally, I miss everything that, it, that we're going to expend on it that's going to cost us. I know this. Dear friends, I know that what's given away is what's multiplied. And I'm so, so excited to see just what that multiplication looks like. Would you stand up with me? Let's pray together. Let's pray to the God who supplies every need that we have in his grace. Dear, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, you have, you've told us that you are able Amidst our, it's impossible. So amidst our, I can't. You've told us that you're the one who is able to do immeasurably more than what we ever could ask or imagine. And so God, now we ask you to show up. Maybe it's a personal thing. Maybe it's in a valley. Maybe it's in a struggle. Maybe it's in a pit. God, we ask for your immeasurably more. God, we show up in this new 
in this new church multiplication, God, when we ask for your multiplication to be our reality. God, for those of us who come here and we're like, I have nothing left to give. I am tired and fatigue has set in. Jesus, show us that you get it, that you've been there and that you have walked with us. And Jesus, you have died for us. And Jesus, you have won us victory. Jesus, we pray all of this in your risen name. Amen.